this uh, is actually my second time trying to shoot this video. The first time I shot it was a week or so ago, and the video ended up being 30 minutes long. I uh, had to do a really crappy rush job of editing on top of that, so I just uh, watched it to uh, attempt to upload it to YouTube, and I uh, it was crap. So I'm redoing it. I've cut a few things out for time issues, and yeah. So let's get started. And by the way, for those of you who are relatively new to my channel, and there's a lot of you, uh, the point of the glasses, the rule I've put in place is that if you see me wearing these, it means I'm doing something uh, intellectual, something that's actually taking, you know, some effort to make. Uh, and if I don't have them, usually it's either some blah 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 update on my life, or it's uh, some kind of drama thing. But, anyway, let's get started. Now, I think, I think, that this is going to be my last video on this subject for a while, at least. And that's simply because, thus far, I haven't really seen much in the way of productivity. I mean, the things that I'm talking about in this video are at least a couple of weeks old, um, or at least a week old. So, unless uh, something happens with this subject, I'm just going to leave it be for now. But, before I leave it be, there's some things that I want to address here. Uh, the first part of this video is going to be dealing with some more critiques of my thesis, uh, or at least one of my thesis, thesis. Uh, the second one part of this video is going to deal with Dr. Jason J. Campbell's response to the video. So, anyway, there have been a few critiques in my video that have come out. Uh, the first one is by a person named 1-800-COCAINE. Now, uh, when he, in the original shot of this video, I was making fun of him uh, across the board, and that's because he, his first comments were, his first few comments at least, were, you know, fail. He was, you know, yelling at me, calling me names, he was taking things that Taking things that I said out of context, he was asking me questions that would have easily been answered if he had watched the uh, video. Uh, you could tell that he was commenting while he was watching the video, rather than watching my video, making an effort to comprehend my argument as a whole, and then commenting. But uh, I decided not to go that route in this shot. Uh, first of all, because that took too long in the first shot. And second of all, he's gotten a lot more civilized. And he's actually gone into more productive discussion at this point. So, I'm not really going to get more into him, but you should definitely check out the comments thread uh, with uh, 1-800-COCAINE and I in the uh, comment section to my original video, uh, and I might even put his, some of his first few comments, uh, in my next I Get Comments video or something like that. Anyway, the next, this next critic isn't really a critic per se, but somebody could take what he said and turn that into a critique of what I said. So let's examine it. And this wasn't on YouTube. This was on another form of media. But his argument was that it's not necessarily, and this is, this is Kripke, uh, according to him, but according to Kripke, it's not the case that 
water is H2O is analytically true because it's only necessary if water is in fact H2O. Kripke's argument is basically that if water is H2O, then water is necessarily H2O. Uh, and Kripke apparently forgot a lot that he used that conditional. But the point is the conditional. And the person could uh, turn that into a critique of me by saying, no, my proposition P that I've been using uh, isn't actually analytic because it's only necessary if it's in fact the case. I don't think that this undermines my premise any, though. And that's because I nowhere, anywhere in my video have I linked analytic propositions with necessary propositions. The two are not equivalent as I'm using them, and the two, they're not even related as far as I'm concerned. Analytic propositions are simply propositions that are self-contained in a way. Essentially, the, to use Kant's wording, the predicate concept is contained in the subject concept. To use a more technical term, it's explicative. Now, uh, nowhere in that definition, as I've stated multiple times, is uh, does that entail necessary propositions. Now, if you want to get into what constitutes a necessary proposition versus a contingent proposition, you need to look into the a priori, a posteriori distinction. If an a posteriori proposition depends on experience, on a specific experience for its truth, then its truth value might be different if experience had been different. So it's contingent on experience. An a priori proposition, however, is completely independent of experience. And therefore, an a priori proposition is necessarily true or false or has this truth value regardless of what experience is. So if we're talking about necessary propositions, um, it's more, a priori is more what we're going for, not analytic. Anyway, the third critic is a guy, or girl actually, I don't know what this person's gender is, uh, goes by the name of Sonk McBean. I hope I said that correctly. But uh, he or she um, says that um, when taking my thesis that water is H2O is analytic a posteriori to its logical extreme, then what we have is that no analytic propositions are a priori, in fact. And it's for this simple reason. And um, this person claims to be dealing exclusively with my third argument, the H2O argument. But whether accidentally or not, uh, he does end up touching upon the fourth as well. Um, more specifically, the idea of language that's contained in my fourth one. The argument is as follows. If we accept that uh, water is H2O is a posteriori in the sense that we need to know what uh, water and H2O are before we can assess the truth value of that proposition, the same is the case for all analytic propositions. Say a bachelor is not married because we need to first verify what con the concept of bachelor is or what the concept of married is in order to assess the truth value of that. So therefore, it's a posteriori. And I completely agree with everything that's been said so far because that's what my fourth argument is all about. When we're talking about a posteriori, 
propositions uh, or analytic propositions. I make the case in my fourth argument that analytic knowledge is in general based on a posteriori knowledge. And then in that argument I make I ask whether that knowledge would be analytic or synthetic, but that's not important here. But I've since realized actually that this is not the case for all analytic statements. There is an exception, and that is exception is those analytic propositions whose truth value is not contingent on the meaning of the words used. And it's only contingent upon uh, the law of identity, which is a law of logic. The law of identity says basically that two things that are identical are, well, identical. In other words, A is always identical to B, and if it's possible that A is not identical to B, then A is not B. Now, if we apply that to certain analytic propositions, and the example that I use, this was via a PM conversation, by the way, uh, with this person. And in P, via PM, I use the example, no married men are married. If I say that no married men are married, or even better, an, a married man is not married, a married man is married, then I don't need to know what married means in order to know that married men are married. I mean, married could mean hot dog for all it matters. Um, married men are married. That's true regardless of any definitions of words. Now, as far as I can tell, uh, the person's response to that, in other words, what I'm saying is that all of these analytic propositions are a priori, whereas the bachelor is an unmarried man, one is a posteriori. But the person's response was something along the lines that, in order to know that the law of identity is true, I need to know that language. Uh, I need to have the a posteriori experience of language in order to know that. And I'm not 100% sure what was meant by that, but what we seem to have here is essentially a disagreement on how we come to know, on the epistemology of logic, how we come to know logic itself. So, um, eventually we might have a conversation about uh, how we come to know logic, um, but I'm gonna, I'm going to wait for that. Now, that's it for uh, critics in this video. Now, uh, Jason himself made a response to my original analytic a posteriori video. And essentially what we're talking about is, you know, he didn't necessarily critique anything that I said uh, so much as he's giving an extra dimension to the question, and I'm going to get into that momentarily. But first I'm going to deal with his, you know, explication of what I said. He, uh, first, he says something that I completely agree with, uh, and which he sees as the point of most of my video, which is that in order to show that a given proposition is analytic a posteriori, you have to show that it's analytic, and you have to show that it's a posteriori, right? Because analytic a posteriori is just a logical conjunction of analytic and a posteriori. So in order to show that a proposition falls into this epistemological category, then we first have to show that it's explicative to use a technical term, though I was trying to avoid using that in the original video for, you know, clarity purposes. But you first have to show it's explicative and therefore analytic, and then you have to show that it's known through experience and is therefore a posteriori. 
and that's what my proposition P, which is water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, which people have been simplifying as water is H2O, which is fine. So water is H2O is explicative because uh, water is by definition H2O, but we only knew that because of experience and therefore it's a posteriori. So, you know, Jason is right on the money here that in order to show that something is analytic a posteriori, you have to show that it's analytic and you have to show that it's a posteriori. So, you know, check on that. Then uh, he's getting into my fourth argument. My argument investigating, uh, you know, the nature of the analytic synthetic distinction itself. And it's not necessarily me arguing that the analytic synthetic distinction needs to be rejected. It's more me trying to force my critic into a position where he or she has to choose his battle. I made an argument that analytic knowledge is based on meanings of words and that these meanings of words are only known a posteriori. And I would now add, with the exception of the, you know, married men are married proposition. But essentially, I then asked the critic, is this knowledge of what words mean analytic knowledge or synthetic knowledge? If it's analytic knowledge, then that means the meanings of words are analytic a posteriori. And therefore, I win because my critic has now admitted that a certain form of knowledge is analytic a posteriori. But if my critic uh, says that this knowledge is synthetic, then that means that analytic knowledge is based on synthetic knowledge. And therefore, we have to reject the analytic synthetic distinction. And the question, is there analytic a posteriori, becomes kind of silly, to be honest. I mean, if there's no analytic synthetic distinction, then distinguishing between analytic a posteriori knowledge and, uh, you know, the types of synthetic knowledge, uh, you know, is kind of almost meaningless. Um, although, and Jason might have been misspeaking here, it's not, he said that it could be all analytic. It's not that it could be all analytic, it's that it could all be synthetic. Uh, and I don't know if you misspoke there, but uh, my argument is that if you accept this one fork of the dichotomy I'm forcing you into, then it's all synthetic, and then the question becomes meaningless. Not necessarily meaningless, but it becomes kind of pedantic to ask it in the first place. And anyway, oh, and by the way, you do say that, you know, you might want to pose this as a discussions and philosophy question. Um, is there a meaningful, is there a need in today's epistemological climate for an analytic synthetic distinction? And, you know, uh, definitely, I would ask you to post that as a discussions and philosophy question. And, like I said, I wasn't arguing now that uh, the analytic synthetic distinction doesn't exist, but I definitely could argue in that fashion if you pose that as a question. But, uh, anyway, you say that you were going to take this question to the next take the analytic a posteriori to the next level. And I was waiting mostly for other people to jump on this boat, but as far as I can tell, nobody else has taken this up. So I'm going to do it myself. Basically, Jason's argument is uh, classical logic works if you're omniscient. It, all, it works if you're omniscient, timeless, right, I mean, the law of non-contradiction, for example, only applies to something being A or not A, 
at the same time and in the same respect. And it assumes that you have full knowledge of the object, right? But the world isn't like that. We, as human beings, aren't omniscient. We change our confidence values in certain propositions as evidence goes on. So, as a result, what we have, we don't just have true or false. We have gradations of truth, which reflect among other things, our confidence in things, a probability value we might assign to them, or in some cases a degree of truth value. And this requires that we abandon the law of excluded middle, that something is either true or it's false. And the logical systems that Jason mentions are fuzzy logic and non-monotonic logic. The question that Jason poses then is in light of that what happened to because when Kant was writing he had no idea that something like fuzzy or non-monotonic logic would emerge. Kant was convinced that a proposition would either be true or it would be false. So in light of that should we reevaluate in that light alone the analytic a posteriori. Now, I'm probably going to disappoint a lot of people here because it might look like I'm copping out. Uh, my answer is no. I'm not convinced that uh, the mere existence of logic or the mere fact that the law of excluded middle may not apply to every logical system or into every situation, I'm not convinced that that fact alone would require reevaluating the possibility of analytic a posteriori knowledge or of re-examining the nature of, you know, our Hume's fork here. I mean, think about it. Let's say in fuzzy logic, instead of a truth value being restricted to either zero or one, true or false, you can have any value between 0 and 1, and these represent degrees of truth. So let's say that we have a proposition that has a truth value in fuzzy logic of 0.6. Now, we can, I think we can meaningfully ask the question, how do we know that its truth value is 0.6, and is experience required for us to know this? If experience is required, it's a posteriori. If experience is not required, it's a priori. And likewise, you can ask the same thing about the nature of the proposition and why it has the truth value of 0.6. Is it because, is it by definition? For example, I can imagine a proposition P saying, this proposition P has truth value 0.6. Now that might be a kind of dumb example, but such a proposition would be analytic. Would be analytic. It would have a value of 0.6 by definition, and a proposition which doesn't have that by definition would have that would have a truth value of 0.6 synthetically. So I think you can meaningfully distinguish between analytic and synthetic, and between a priori and a posteriori even without having a law of the excluded middle. So, you know, I'm sorry, I probably disappointed a lot of people by arguing this, but um, I just don't see it. But, you know, maybe someone will surprise me here. Anyway, that's all I have. So this is probably going to be the last video on the analytic a posteriori I'll do for a while unless, you know, I state otherwise or, and, uh, you know, make a discussions and philosophy question on the analytic synthetic distinction, Jason, uh, you know, critics, uh, yeah, see ya.